Good morning. Very nice to see you all again. Now we're going to do something extremely fun. My mom always said, life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. I'm having what the Germans call a schadengasm. someplace else. We're all stocked up here. Guess what? I got a fever. And the only prescription is for cowbell. Hey everybody, welcome! Good to be back. Sorry for the delay. Uh, well, last week was a holiday, so I canceled at the last minute. Figured people would have Easter stuff. Some of you, anyway. Um, but yeah, uh, it's been three weeks since my last stream, so I want to thank you for coming back to me. Uh, so we've got Sargon here, and Alan, Luis, Mick, Wilton, hello, and Alejandro, and Murad. Good to see you all here. Hope more of you... Uh, chime in and say hello if you're here just let us know where you're at and of course as always let us know if you have any questions along the way my wife debbie will be here to help uh, field questions here shortly uh so today we're going to talk about caricature bodies drawing bodies for caricature specifically uh dynamic active bodies now i've done a little bit of this in the past i think it was august of last year in 2020 where i did a couple streams on um, drawing the body uh, for caricature. But this one is going to be a little bit more focused on, again, action, motion, telling the story through a pose. And uh, I don't know, so it might be some repetition, but repetition is always good. And uh, I'm also going to talk about my traditional body drawing process that I learned, uh, you know, just from life drawing classes at the school I went to here in San Diego for years. Uh, because all that fundamental training, that traditional training, is really what I think has helped me the most in all forms of art, in caricature or fine art or realistic, whatever it is. Good fundamental training is just critical because, like, I, because it means fundamental is just that. It's it can be applied towards anything that you branch off into. You don't you don't need to study just caricature to be a good caricaturist. You really do need to cross train and study other disciplines, do life drawing, portrait drawing, landscapes, still lifes, different media. It, it all helps. Everything you do in art helps everything else in art that you do. I'm a big proponent of that. And uh, and I try to practice that as much as I preach it. So, uh, Hey, uh, Jim and Monica, welcome. Miro, Lucas. 
uh, Praveen, hello. So, uh, yeah, so I guess we'll just get right into it here. Uh, no reason to delay. Uh, what I'm going to do first is gonna I'm going to do a few warm-up drawings that are timed, just five minutes uh, from photos, and I'll share the photos on the screen. Uh, and just to get the gesture, just to get my hand warmed up, and uh, really, too, the first five minutes of any figure drawing is really the most important, or the first few minutes, however fast or slow you are, but the first part where you get the gesture and the motion of the figure down. The proportions and anatomy, that can come later, uh, but if the motion and the, 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 the pose is uh, stiff or awkward, the rest of the figure is going to be terrible. This is the foundation on which everything is built. So um, let's take a look at our first one here. Uh, sorry about the black boxes. That's just, you know, YouTube. I just want to, um, you know, make sure my video doesn't get flagged or anything like that. So <laughs> I want to make it safe for the family and that sort of thing. So, all right, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and start. And I won't be able to, you know, talk, take questions for the first few minutes here while I'm drawing because uh, I'm going to be pretty focused. But I'm going to start a timer uh, so I don't go over five minutes. So whenever I do start, I... I tend to start with the head. Uh, it doesn't really matter what shape. It can be round, egg-shaped, triangular, whatever you see it as. And then I try to get the overarching motion of the pose. And that's the through line from the head down to the, usually the foot that's most extended or the one that's bearing the most weight. And I see it as this sort of like, you know, it's like a C-curve, maybe an S-curve slightly. Uh, that weight-bearing foot is almost directly underneath the head. And that's usually what happens in a standing pose is the foot uh, that's bearing the weight is going to be directly beneath the head if the person's balanced. If they're off balance, if they're like in the middle of jumping or running or flying or something, that, you know, all bets are off. But this is the most important part. This here is the simple gesture. Now there's a more complex gesture I'm going to do too, and that's gesture with a little bit of the form. So I'm going to just draw basically the thickness of the torso, the thickness of the legs, and that's going to be the simple gesture. So I'll just go ahead and do that now. Okay, I'm actually going to need to shrink this down a bit because that arm is a little bit higher than the rest of the figure. You can do that when working digitally, but on paper, you got to make sure you plan it out properly. So in these quick gesture sketches, the, the thing that suffers the most or that is the least accurate is going to be the proportions. Uh, I just want to get the motion, the action, the general vibe of what's happening so that someone looking at this could translate this pose and go, oh, I know exactly what that pose is doing. So when you do your own figure drawings, timing yourself is a really good technique to keep you on track because you just don't want to try to do too much in too short of a time. Uh, you just always want to uh, cater your uh, goals for the session for however much time you have. And anything three to five minutes is basically a gesture drawing. Or a quick sketch, figure quick sketch, whatever you want to call it. And next, I generally like to fill in uh, just rudimentary, like rib cage, hips, uh, the mass of the thighs. Uh, I'm not going to draw an actual skeleton or anything like that, but I do want to get some of that the structure and those landmarks in there. I'm thinking about pinch and stretch. So there's a side of the figure where there's going to be more pinching of the forms, which is the back side. And then there's more stretching generally along the front side where everything's going to be smoother and more uh, graceful lines. I really prefer to do these kind of sketches uh, in charcoal and newsprint. Uh, that's just what I'm most comfortable in. Uh, it's just, you know, it's sometimes hard to demonstrate on that when you're doing a stream or doing something digital. So I figured a digital drawing demo is going to be best here. I got about a minute and a half left here looking at my timer. Again, just simple idealized mannequinized form. It's not too specific to this actual model. 
uh, but it's just like a simplified mannequin version of that model. Things like the hair, I usually ignore, you know, on a pose this short, I'm just going to draw, like I said, just the simple forms of this particular human being. And if I have time, I'll get it a little bit into mapping out the shadows. Like there is a nice form shadow running down the uh, center of the body here. Maybe I'll increase the size of my pencil a little bit so it's a little thicker and get a softer edge. The lighting here's oh, there goes my timer. Um, the lighting here's fairly soft. There's not a lot of really strong shadows, which I really like strong shadows on a on a figure. It just helps define the forms a lot better. Anyway, so there's the first one there. Nice, simple. Not didn't think too much about it, just kind of did it. Alrighty. Let's go ahead and start on the second one. And I, uh, you know, feel free to start asking your questions or talking if you want, and Debbie will help me in just a minute. But um to uh let's see which one's next here yeah i'm here hi everybody oh it's using that oh that's weird it's using my um you know let me turn that off i'll just drag this down in here just manually oh that's really weird usually the, these pictures float on top of the palette hmm. um let's get that palette moved out of here and I'm not going to use color today. I'm just drawing with black and white, so I'll just keep this over here. There we go. Some of you may know these photos if you uh, subscribe to the Proko, uh, any of the Proko courses. These are uh, Stan Proko Pinko's model photos. Uh, you can purchase these, actually, from the Proko website. And uh, there are a lot of great, great uh, models and poses in there. Okay, make sure I'm on a new layer. Okay. And start the timer. There we go. I'm going to start with the head, just try to get the general angle down. A little bit of the angle of the shoulders here. Let's get the, um, the, the, the gesture of the pose, basically the spine down to the weight-bearing foot. Or the foot, you know, just whatever one is the most extended. And in this pose, it's the foot that's closer to us, so I think I'll probably do that. Rather than the far foot. Even though the far foot is the one, the one that's further away from us is the one that looks like bearing most of the weight. It's just whatever you feel. It's there's no real rules to it necessarily. So this is more of a uh, jagged, like a Z curve. You know, it's not as graceful as the other pose, uh, but that's okay. That's the motion. That's the simple gesture of the pose that describes the main line of action. Now I'm going to do the sort of the form of the pose with just the gesture in mind and nothing else. No anatomy. No rib cage. Just you know, triangle for the torso, cylinders for the legs, that sort of thing. I like to start simply, and I don't want to do too much too soon, because if the gesture is off, if it looks unbalanced or awkward, I haven't spent too much time on it. I can just scrap it and then just move on to the next one. If you can find ways to make the figure more graceful, to make the curves more S-like, more sinewy, more curvy, that's always a good thing because that generally creates a nicer flow. The eye flows more nicely uh, over the forms of the body when you uh, can find ways to make the actual drawing more graceful looking. So this is interesting. The arms are, the forearms are hidden because he's holding a bat, but I want to get the angles of the, of the upper arms correct. So I might draw a through line from one arm to the other to make sure they match up. And then the baseball bat is coming out of the back of his neck. It's basically straight up and down, but you know what? To make it fit on this page a little better, it probably wouldn't hurt to just angle it a little bit more. Because that that's believable, you know, holding the baseball bat is not, you know, a, a law. It doesn't, you know, you can make it whatever you want it to be, whatever angle. 
So, and these poses are a little, there's something about them. I think the camera was a kind of close to the model. So there's some quite a bit of foreshortening happening. Their legs, his legs look a lot shorter than they should be than if we were here, there in life. So I just want to keep that in mind too, as I'm drawing the figure, drawing the proportions. But like I said, the portion, the proportions aren't as critical in this uh, type of quick sketch where I'm just doing a few minutes on each pose. But it wouldn't hurt to maybe extend this foot, you know, extend this leg a little bit longer just to make it look more natural and realistic. Like he doesn't have one leg that's shorter than the other. Okay, that's the simple gesture. Very geometric, very rigid. Uh, so I might next, you know, do the rib cage. might do his delts. He's a very, you know, ripped guy, very buff. So he's actually, you don't really see the rib cage. You just see all this pack of muscles around the upper body. So maybe I'll do the uh, center line of the uh, back of the spine here, which has a bit of a C curve to it. Down to the buttocks here, when that's more in profile view. So the torso's twisting a bit. We're seeing more of the back of the back, uh, whereas we're seeing only the side of the hip and buttock area. Might do some simple indication of the musculature. There's the rib cage right here, uh, and then the belly. But at this stage, I'm still just trying to create a graceful drawing. Uh, not too much worried about the proportions. They just don't have time in this level, uh, at this speed. Until you're like really, really good. And then, of course, the proportions will just tend to be more accurate the more experience you have with life drawing and figure drawing. And I'm just building some real simple anatomy on top of the um, the framework that I've built for myself. Not going too crazy, though. It's just, again, I don't have time. I've got 30 seconds. <laughs> Maybe the head gets a little, just a little bit bigger here, a little bit more mass to the head. And I'll just choose one leg to try to, you know, resolve a little bit more than the other one, just because I just don't have time. Because in a real classroom situation, the model's going to stop posing at that five minutes. You don't have the opportunity to, uh, you don't have the opportunity to uh, continue drawing, really, because they're just moving on to the next pose. Okay, pose two done. Uh, let's take a little, quick little break, take a look at the questions here. Um, I'm here, actually. You know, can you open the door a little bit more, Debbie? I can't really hear you. Yeah, so uh, let me know if there's anything I can talk about or answer right now. Well, that's too much. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and we try to keep uh, a door between us because otherwise we get a double uh, microphone. You know, one microphone picks up, Debbie and... There's like an echo. Would you like me to read the question or do you want to do this one? Yeah, why don't you, uh, whatever question pops up, I didn't really have time to read them yet. Okay, are you ready? Yes. All right, this one's from Alan. When you started studying Frank Riley, did you learn to use body rhythm for the figure as well or did you just focus on the head? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I almost do no Riley rhythms when I'm drawing the figure. Uh, we, we studied it, but it was more of an afterthought. Not, not, not really an afterthought, I wouldn't say, but it just wasn't prioritized like it was for the face. The Riley rhythms for the head and the face were used a lot at my school, but um, I didn't really delve into it for the body so much. I, I didn't find those rhythms as useful. I used the idea, though, of rhythmical lines and, you know, abstraction in general for drawing the figure. But, um, yeah, I don't use specifically the, the Riley rhythms for the body. So, Ready for another? Yeah. Luis asks, are you going to, uh, where'd it go? Oh, this chat scrolls. Are you going to make a caricature sketch of the body or a realistic one? Yeah, after these warm-up sketches, these five-minute warm-ups, I'm going to do um, the uh, doing caricature bodies from photos. Um, but warm-ups, I think, are just critical. It's a real important part of any drawing session you have uh, to get your hand warmed up, especially when you're doing something a little bit more realistic or, uh, you know, anatomy-based, like th things like the figure. It's just really, really helpful. 
Okay, and then let's do this one here. It's a sitting pose. And how long are you timing these for? Five minutes each. You Would you like a 30 second heads I have up? a timer going in here. All right, just trying to help. <laughs> That's all right now. I mean, yeah, if you want to shout out, you know, 30 seconds, but I, you don't know where my timer's at. You like, could always uh, let me control it. Yeah, I could. Maybe the next one. Next time. Okay. Never mind. Okay, sort of just a figure eight shape to the pose here, sort of an hourglass shape. It wasn't much to the gesture of this pose. It was just the spine is just sort of a real subtle S curve. And then, of course, there are the legs, but they're almost completely hidden by the body. So this is the simple gesture of the pose here. And the uh, arms. The arms sort of, the, the arms form a continuous sort of rhythm with the legs. So look, look for that all the time when you see that. Um, the other things I'm trying to keep in mind when drawing a figure, especially if it's more complex or active, is the uh, negative space. Like if there's a gap between the arm and the torso, I you know usually like a triangular shape. I try to capture that. I look for plumb lines, which means just something above, directly above that lines up with something else, or side to side horizontally that can be plumb lines. But that can also help you line up things, uh, like where a foot lines up with the head, uh, is a real good thing to try to look for in a uh, in a pose. So plumb lines, negative space. What else? I mean, generally, the angles, you know, how, you know, straight or angular a, a shape is. Uh, I try to keep my lines sort of curvy and sinewy, though. So there's, you know, the angles are constantly changing because they're essentially rounded forms, rounded lines. The uh, rib cage actually comes in front of the arm in this case here. Just depends on the angle you're at. Okay, I'm going to add just a little bit more anatomy now, just sort of squaring off some shapes here. We got the scapula and shoulder just outside the rib cage here. And the hips are sort of uh, almost squared off here. There's a sort of a boxy shape to them, not overly round. The gesture beneath the uh, the shape of the torso here is round, it, rounded and graceful and sort of like an S curve. But then when I build the anatomy on top of it, it's going to be, it's going to square that off a little bit. But I still want to maintain that connection to that that graceful rhythm that's lying beneath. Otherwise, the figure can end up looking a little bit disjointed and compartmentalized. And you want, the, in the figure, one thing to constantly flow into another thing. Everything's connected. And, uh, you know, I I don't think personally I'm really qualified to teach proper figure drawing. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I know enough about it, but I may not be the best guy to look for for that kind of thing. Um, You're too modest. Well, I mean, I, I, I kind of know what I'm doing, but um, I don't think I'm as consistent, at, you know, in my successes as a lot of my teachers were that taught me. <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, mad enough to admit that. But, uh, you know, I, spe I specialize more in the face. Uh, and I have real, I definitely have an expertise in that, but, uh, I figure, um, yeah, it's, um, it's something I, you know, I find myself struggling a lot with, but, uh, you know, my struggles might be different from yours. Maybe I can pass along some good nuggets of information and do a reasonably good job, but, uh, I don't want people to think I'm claiming to be an expert on figure drawing or anything. That's tough. That's a, a long shot. Okay, got about 40 seconds left here. This one, she's wearing heels. That's interesting. For the leg and the foot, I just try to find the rhythm that connects the, the shin down to the you know, top of the foot, down to the toes. Okay, a little bit of time, so I'll add some hair in here, I think. Mm 
There's the timer. Okay, let's just do one more warm-up sketch here. This is a cool pose, sort of like a Spider-Man pose. Ooh, trying to, uh, there we go. Got to resize this thing here so it fits on the screen. Down a little bit. Okay. And start the timer, five minutes. Start with the head. It's also a skill to be able to sort of fit all your thumbnail gesture drawings onto one page. Uh, you know, when I was training at the school, we would, um, you know, sometimes do these two or three minute sketches and you could fill up 20 drawings or, you know, 10 drawings on a page uh, and you just gotta make it work. I mean, you don't have to, but it's kind of fun to try, you know, to, it creates a nice composition if you could balance all the figures with each other on a, on a uh, page. And is this your final drawing? Yeah, this is the final, final warm-up warm -up. realistic okay. figure sketch. After this, I'm going to go into my uh, caricature mode. So here's the through line of the pose here, just this spine, you know, this curved back. And I would say... Um, I mean, but the legs split off equally from one side to the other, but I'd say the weight-bearing foot is the one here closest to the body, supporting the mass of the body. And that's kind of just a continuation of that curve of the spine. And it connects with the front of the uh, torso here, the chest. Then the uh, far foot here is sort of this arcing shape. Extends pretty far out. The arms, looking at the negative space between the arm and the legs, right about here. Just keeping like a simple shape, simple like cylinders. Uh, because, you know, it's just, it's such a complex pose. You just, in a short amount of time, you have to keep it as simple as possible. So even if you do have all the time in the world, you know, in your studio, you're doing figure drawings, I do recommend keeping yourself timed on these warm-up sketches and also if it's something you're doing for a job if you're starting a job or an assignment that is going to be something you're going to be spending a lot of time on don't spend a lot of time on the gesture get it down as fast as you can uh, because it's, i think it just helps it helps you think economically about the figure it helps you think uh you know you, there's not a lot of extraneous details it just the gesture should be quick you should be fast at uh, reproducing that on the page Okay, just um, adding some simplified forms here now to the, the uh, to the anatomy. It goes without saying that this will go a lot easier. This kind of, these kind of sketches, if you have a lot of experience drawing the figure and looking at the anatomy. Uh, again, I'm not an expert at human anatomy for the figure for the body. I've studied it, um, but not to the point where I feel like I could teach it. That's a different level of understanding, I think. <laughs> um, to me, I, I still, I think I'm just sort of a student, a student with a lot of experience, but a student nonetheless, when it comes to the anatomy of the body. But, um, I have enough confidence with it that I can sort of, you know, intuitively create anatomy and have it look pretty good, pretty reasonable facsimile of real anatomy. <laughs> um, you know, the more time I have to spend on something, definitely I can observe it more closely. Um, but, you know, I don't have every mu muscle mem memorized, but I do have the masses of the forms sort of committed to this ingrained memory because I've done so much of it, so much figure drawing from life and studying from books that I can do a little bit of figure invention if I absolutely need to, like when the when the reference isn't very good or if I don't have reference. And I've done plenty of caricature illustrations for jobs, for magazines or clients, where I just, I didn't 
really have much of a reference for the body. I just sort of invented it. And uh, being confident with folds, drapery studies, uh, having done a lot of that too, that is really, really helpful when you're doing figure invention because pretty much every commercial illustration or job you do for someone, they're going to be clothed. <laughs> but you, uh, you, you do need to have a good knowledge of what's happening underneath the clothing in order to invent good anatomy, I think. About 30 seconds left here. If you can throw any indication in there of the head angle with the ear or with the center line, that's always a good thing. Okay. All right. Whew. There we go. That's a good, good warm up. I feel good about that. Um, filled up a little page. I've got, you know, four figures here. Relatively good gestures. I didn't exaggerate the action too much, but that's what I'm going to be talking about next. When doing caricature, figures, caricature bodies, not only do you exaggerate the proportions and the anatomy and the forms, but also the motion or the action. I mean, it's up to you how much you want to exaggerate it, I guess. I shouldn't say you always have to. It just depends on your style and what your client wants, uh, how much you're going to exaggerate it. But you're definitely allowed to, I think, in caricature, illustration, uh, exaggerate the pose or the motion to make it more extreme. Cool. Yeah. Do you want to take some questions before you start? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Let's take a little break here and talk about Need to what people are rest asking. your hand. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions about uh, your Biden-Harris caricature. Mm, okay. Uh, let's see. Lucas was wondering what happened to it. Did you get it published in a magazine or... Uh, well, that was just a personal piece that I did, um, but I do have, actually, I'm working with a guy right now who wants to market and sell it on various items. Uh, so I'll let you know more about that. Uh, I think they're going to set up an online shop for it. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen with it, but I've got an agreement with someone to, who really liked it and is going to be uh, publishing it uh, for sale. Um, I think you can also just buy a fine art print of it on my store. I believe I put it up for sale on my courtjones.com website. If so. not, you probably should. Yeah, I, th I think it is. Yeah, I'll double check. Yeah. Uh, I have another one, another question similar to the last question from Luis. Uh, basically asking, have you ever worked at political caricatures or political cartoons? Yeah, not political cartoons per se, um, which are, you know, the little things that you see, the one panel gags, because I don't really, you know, I've just never really done that. It's Those are real special people that are amazing insightful funny can work on tight deadlines you know and then they just do like simple cool ink drawings um you know i could draw them i think i'd be fine drawing them but i just i can't come up with ideas on a daily basis like have, that have you ever done political drawings that are just ink sketches instead of fully rendered paintings like the biden one um yeah yeah some um because i feel like most of the caricatures of political people that you have on your site are fully rendered. Yeah, I mean, that's just kind of what I mo mostly do. There is a section on my site that has pen and ink stuff, but it's mostly like theatrical illustrations and not so much political. I don't know, just, you know, I just haven't had that type of career where clients wanted pen and ink drawings of political caricatures. Uh, they mostly want my paintings. So if I did more of it, if I, that's what I advertised on my site, I would probably get more of that type of work. And it's pretty fun, but I think you can, you know, uh, you can charge more for color paintings than for ink drawings on the on the whole. I think if you're there's some special exceptions, if you're the most amazing, famous inker in the world, you can definitely command higher prices. Uh, but, you know, as far as the amount of time it takes, uh, it definitely takes longer to do realistic renderings and paintings um, than most of the ink type work that's out there. But you can definitely spend a lot of time on inkings as well. If that's your thing, if that's your style, if you're someone like Bernie Wrightson. Um, yeah, you know, you can uh, spend a long, long time on a uh, inking. But, uh, no, I just I just went down that road, and that's that's fine with me. I like painting. I like rendering. I like making things look realistic. But I love inking, too. So I wouldn't mind getting more of that type of genre. I just don't tend to get it. Yeah, I'm going to start on this guy here, and we'll be able to talk more right after I start this. But I've got this great 
uh, strong man from the early, I don't know, 20th century, late 19th century. Is I that, just love these guys. Is that from Strength Magazine, 1915? I, maybe. It's not one of the ones you showed me. I just oh, found it somewhere. yeah. What a great body. <laughs> yeah. So um, he's obviously very squat, very thick. Um, by today's standards, he would look chubby, but, you know, he's not. He looks very solid. He's very muscular. He's just barrel chested and just thick. So I'm going to definitely exploit that and play up on that. So the head's going to be probably pretty small in proportion to the body when you're drawing someone who's a muscle figure or a strong person. Uh, generally, you know, on a male type, the heroic type, uh, the heads get smaller. But just like with my uh, anatomical figure drawings, the realistic ones, I want to create the simple gesture here. I'm going to go with the, the main action of the pose from the... Uh, head down to the foot. He's sort of puffing out his rib cage and chest and stomach a bit, so that's what's going to be coming forward, maybe even a little bit more in front of his uh, head. There we go. But I don't want his body to look like a snake, you know, it has to have uh, contrasting bulges and shapes, you know, on the opposite side, so that's what this next stage is about, with, you know, doing the uh, the next step of the gesture drawing, which is the, the simple forms. You know, it might be helpful to do little tiny thumbnail sketches to figure out the proportions, like with any caricature. Um, but, you know, I don't really have time for that right now. So I'm just going to just wing it on this particular one here. There's a little rump sticking out there. One leg crossing in front of the other. Real thick legs. I love drawing from historical photos. They just they were just very cool looking back then, their faces and their bodies, the wardrobe especially. And his uh fist is fitting right here in the crux of his uh back where it meets the hip. I think a real tiny hand would be good. It'll help uh, show the difference between, you know, it'll really show that bulkiness of the rest of his forms. If Because, you know, when you're a muscle person, generally your hands don't get bigger and your feet don't get bigger. They'll stay smaller by comparison to everything else. So it'll make the body look that much more bulky and muscular if you keep things like the hands and feet small. Whereas if you want to make a person look diminutive and weak or, you know, um, slinky or skinny in their body, you might want to give them larger hands and larger feet by by comparison. It'll help make their body look more meek and weak. Okay, I got the simple gesture here. And I'm just going to go ahead and start building some forms on top of it. I think the head might actually need to come over just a little bit. Looks a little bit far over to the left. Let me know if there's any more comments or questions, Debbie. I was just going to ask. You must be psychic. I can read your mind now. <laughs> I have a question from Murad asking, how do you know if you're good enough, if your portrait drawings are good enough or your figure drawings? Um, Nothing's well, ever good enough, is it? You it, always yeah, want to you know, be what, improving. You know, yeah, every artist, I think, has that question with themselves, and they never think they're good enough. There's always an imposter syndrome feeling, I think, no matter who you are, unless you're just totally, totally awesome or totally, totally full of yourself. <laughs> so it's not a bad thing to think that, I think. It's very natural. Um, I mean, but yeah, there's certain times maybe you don't want to enter the marketplace when you're truly, truly rough and unpolished and don't have good fundamentals. Yeah, maybe hold off, get some more schooling. There's definitely uh, room to, always room to improve. Um, but... On, on, you know, if you start getting work from people, that is pretty good validation. I mean, but if you're not getting work from people and you are really skilled, you might think, oh, I'm no good because no one's, you know, buying my work or offering to commission me. And then you might get down on yourself when you shouldn't because, you know, you're still really good. You just might need to expose yourself to people more or market better or get into a new environment where people can see what you're capable of or join more groups, uh, enter competitions to get your name out there, to get your work out there. So there's lots of things you can do that will 
uh, attract more work to you. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, from an early, early age, I was getting work. And, well, in college, you know, I would say. In high school, I was, you know, even junior high, I was doing stuff for the school, like the yearbook illustrations or murals or and stuff like that. Um, because, you know, I was the art guy, even at that age. I, looking back, I was terrible. I mean, I mean, truly, I mean, it was not good. But I was better than the person sitting next to me, I guess, who didn't, you know, do art at all. <laughs> uh, but that encouraged me. That gave me enough, um, you know... Uh, encouragement whatever to just to pursue it more and to get better at it uh, because people back then you know believed in little 12 year old court or courtney at that time <laughs> who uh you know could you know barely hold a pencil really well it depends to what your goal is is your goal to make money is your goal to show in a gallery i guess it really depends Because there are a lot of artists out there making great livings, and they're objectively just terrible. <laughs> um, I'm not, you know, I can't think of any. I'm not going to name names, obviously. But, you know, I there's a lot of art I personally think is just phony. It's just, oh, God, why does anyone like, like that? But, you know, it speaks to someone, and someone appreciates it. And that's enough. That's all you need is to, to have your artwork speak to someone. Um, to a, a few someones, hopefully. Um, but, you know, there's people that don't, you know want to do realism at all and that's totally fine um some people are just completely abstract people just throw paint on a canvas some people don't you know whatever assemble pieces of junk from the junkyard and that's art too and that's that's great but you know, there's an audience for that but yeah stuff like this it's uh there are objective standards if you want to be a realist or a representational artist you definitely do have to meet certain standards and be able to convincingly draw forms and render things Not that there's less challenge in being a simplistic or abstract expressionist or anything like that. It's just a different set of challenges. Um, it's definitely not for me. I just don't like looking at that kind of stuff, so I don't like to do it. So, but, um, yeah, we all define our success differently, I guess, depending on what your goals are. It's a big question that you're asking, so yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could always ask people who are in the know, people that are actually doing it, people that you know are in the profession that you want to be in. And see what they think. Try to get their honest, unvarnished opinion. And tell them, hey, you know, I'm not looking for validation. I'm not looking for pats on the back. I really want to know, hey, what do you think? Am I ready to, like, get jobs? And then, yeah, that's a good way, you know, to go. Because, you know, most people will shoot you straight. If, if you tell them that, that you truly are looking for an honest assessment of where they stand. Um, and keep in mind, too, that those artists don't know everything. And, you know, even if, whatever, no matter what they say, if they say you're not ready, it doesn't mean you're not necessarily ready. But it's definitely good to get learned opinions from people who are experienced. I'm going to draw that mustache because I have to. I'm not going to draw the rest of the face. but You are or aren't going to draw? I, I am. I am right now. But I know you can't see it because it's like 20 seconds behind. Yeah, we need to uh, work on that. That's a problem. Did and you so, want to talk about the drawing a little bit then, or did you want another question? Um, that's about it, I guess. I just, uh, you know what? I think I drew the buff Pringles man. This is what he looks like uh, below the neck. Well, he started off looking like the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I like his pose, the little foot in front. You know, yeah. that's to make you look a little slimmer. Yeah, he just, it's funny, just he looks, he's standing so daintily by today's standards, you know, whatever that means. Anyway, so there's lots of ways you can go with exaggerating this particular figure. For, for some people's taste, this might even be a little subdued or not exaggerated enough, and that's totally valid. Uh, I just try to stick pretty close to the anatomy that's there, because I do want to do references to the real anatomy. I want to make sure I do the deltoids and the pecs and the leg muscles if they're visible um the more you distort and exaggerate the shapes and the forms it does get a little harder to draw realistic anatomy so i do tend to stay within a, a narrow range i don't exaggerate too crazy when i'm doing figures for my uh, illustrations okay let's go ahead and do another one here let's see do i have any 
female figures. I got these muscle men here. It'd be, it'd be good to do a lady figure now, actually. Balance it out. A muscle lady? Not a muscle lady, but oh, here's one. Um, I think it's uh, Venus Williams in a really, really interesting pose. Kind of difficult pose. Everything's very twisted and uh, contorted. Let me size that down here. But this is a great sports pose, great action pose uh, to use as an example here, I think. Let me go to this guy. Okay. And I'm not timing these, just so you know, but I do try to stay within, you know, a short amount of time just so it's not too boring for you guys. Uh, but I'm going to start the same way as the other poses. I'm going to start with the head. Keep it in mind the balance of like where everything's going to go. And the fact that she's sort of a long figure. She's very long and thin. Uh, sinewy. And she has this racket in her hand. So the head is almost completely on this far right side of the uh, page here. All right, let me get the main action of the pose here from the spine down to the, uh, I guess it's the foot that's most extended here. Or it could be the rear foot. The rear foot is pretty dynamic too, so it's going to be like this really strong C curve if I use that foot as the main through line of the pose. Yeah, that, that works, I think. Like I said, it's the, the main line of action that you see in the gesture is kind of up to you. There's no real rules for it. So whatever looks to you like the most interesting dynamic through line this is usually what I try to indicate first. Okay, let me get the angles of the shoulders here. That's usually another good place to start once you start drawing the simplistic forms. Uh, let me actually also add, so I'm going to add like a double action line here for the hips and this front leg because it is pretty significant and an important part of the pose. And this hip actually comes out pretty far compared to the head, so it's going to come out here and have this sort of general curvature to it. Okay. And while I'm at it, I'm just going to go ahead and add the arms as well. Just stick figure arms essentially here. Okay, and the racket's going to be up here. Maybe the racket will be off the page. It's not that important right now for our purposes. So, yeah, sort of a complicated gesture here, uh, but I thought it was necessary because there's so many angles and limbs flying in different directions here. So let's start with the simplistic forms. I'm going to draw just a basic V shape for the torso right now. Real strong stretch on this right extended side of the figure here. One simple C curve there. Whereas we got strong pinching of the forms on this side, on the left side. Are you up for a question? Yeah, sure. Alan was asking, oh, and hold on, it disappeared. I love technology. <laughs> where to go, where to go? Alan, here we go. Uh, understood from your Proko videos, you interacted with Stan Proko. Have you interacted with Marshall Vandruff much or at all? Did you ever have him as a teacher while studying art? Um, yeah, I mean, I know Marshall. Uh, we don't really hang out or talk much. Just I see him at events or, you know, occasionally when doing stuff with Stan. Um, yeah, we, um, run, you know, friendly terms, but I don't, uh, yeah, have much cause to, uh, socially interact or call them or anything. <laughs> Got one more. Mm -hmm. Uh, Miro is considering buying an iPad, the 12.9 inch one to start digital drawing. He's used to drawing on a four size paper and sometimes a3 which i have to look up i always forget what sizes those are do you think this is a good size tablet yes I'm or no sure, well, i'm sure debbie can help me with this <laughs> one because she has the 12.9 and i have the newer ipad 
uh, Pro that's the smaller screen, a little bit smaller. It's like 10.3 or whatever, um, or 11. It's like 11 something. It, it looks a lot smaller though because it has a smaller bezel. But I, I do like drawing on Debbie's more. I haven't really done much of it, but oh really? No, oh. yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of big screens, big drawing surfaces. Um, I don't do much drawing on my iPad, you know, 11 inch, whatever it is, at, at all, really. <laughs> um, and part of it is the screen size, but the other part is just, you know, setting it up and having keyboard there. You know, I don't, I haven't really done that. I know you can set it up with the keyboard for your shortcuts, but I really like having my keyboard shortcuts there. And so I usually just sit and draw at my desk here with my Cintiq. Uh, what do you think, Debbie? How do you like drawing on the uh, Pro? Well, I like I like my tablet. I'm actually using it right now, my iPad. Uh, the twelve point nine. The only thing for me is it's not super portable. So if you want to take it out and put it in a bag, you know, it's easier to carry the smaller one. But I mean, I like it. Yeah, I mean, personally, I would go with, if you can afford it, get the larger screen size whenever possible. On any tablet that's just my personal opinion yeah and i have i think it's the first generation is that right court i'm trying to remember i don't know can't remember yeah i have the one that doesn't have the pencil that attaches to the side mine you have to actually plug the plug the pencil into the port on the lightning port on the ipad to charge it but the newer ones i think right court it's just yeah, charges Apple by a magnet on charges, the side yeah on the side that's what mine does that's convenient but i almost never use it and that pencil is constantly needing to be you know it's all if it's always attached it's always draining the battery of the ipad so i probably should detach it because i don't use it that much for drawing Ooh. and the ipad battery would last longer but i'm afraid i'd lose the pencil if i detached it from the magnetic side so yeah i think i would have to agree with court if you can afford the larger one i would get the larger one Okay, so this is the simple forms here, not very anatomical, but um, the next step I think here would be what I would personally do because I have so many scratchy lines is I would dim this layer down and draw on top of it. I think I did that with the Kobe Bryant uh, drawing that I did over the summer. Uh, I did layers and then dim them down and then drew on top of them just so I, it's easier to draw without having to constantly erase things. I would still keep this drawing pretty simple. Uh, just because of the time, again, I, I could spend, you know, three hours making this look pretty nice, but uh, I'm not going to do that. I want to, you know, draw more bodies for today. But I do want a little bit of reference to the musculature here, as far as I can see it in the photo. Regardless of all the, you know, the musculature and rib cage and everything that's on this far side, I still want to constrain my shapes to that long, sinewy rhythm shape that's running down the side of the form here. In other words, I don't want to make too many, like, contour changes because it's going to disrupt the action or the flow. So in this um, indication of, I think it's the uh, lats here wrapping around the side, or it could be the scapula muscles, like the... Oh, the terrace minor, terrace major muscles. Um, I think that's what they are because they're a little higher up. Um, I don't want to make them too you know, bulgy here because it'll break that um, that simple, nice rhythm that I had going. 
there's going to be definitely more pinching and bulging on the uh, compact side of the form over here. I can't tell these are shorts or a skirt. There may be one of those things. It's both. I'm not really sure. A jort, right? What did you say? Is she wearing a skirt or a short? Did you say a jort? Yeah, isn't that what they call? They're called jorts. What's a jort? A combination skirt short, right? Isn't that a that thing? That would be a like a skort. A skort. Um. Yeah. No. Jort. <laughs> uh, I don't know. And wherever you can um, throw in the shadows too, that's always a good thing because it can help reveal the shapes of the forms, the three-dimensional qualities of the forms here. So there's a nice cast shadow from the skirt <laughs> uh, onto the leg. Getting the perspective right on shoes when they're at really odd angles like this is pretty tricky. Yeah, that's not quite right, but it's going to have to do for now because I don't want to spend too much time on things like that. Okay, just a little bit more to do on this one here. A really foreshortened uh, lower leg here, so it's not going to appear as long as the uh, as the front leg. What are you doing now? Oh, just finishing up here. Um, trying to make the forms look sort of complete and relatively anatomically correct, but without going into too much detail. Do you feel like women are harder to draw when it comes to caricatured bodies for you? No, no harder than men. Actually, it might be a little easier. Um, like, not easier, but... Um, 
I don't know, maybe it's because of experience in our model drawing classes. We tend to draw, there tend to be, tends to be more female models or more models, more females who model for us at the art schools. So I'm very used to it. And the proportions of females generally work out pretty well in a drawing, uh, the way the bodies and, you know, proportions are put together. Sometimes men can be sort of awkward looking and don't have as many sort of graceful rhythmic lines as women do. Um, and it's just sort of a generalization, but it's, it's something I think about now that I'm being asked about it, I guess. Oh, and I saw someone earlier in the chat congratulated you on 4,000 subscribers. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. Reached 4,000 subscribers as of this past week or two. Didn't even know it happened because I was off last week. <laughs> so, you know, it's not, you know, huge for you too, but I'm proud of it, you know. I've earned every one of those. So I thank you guys for subscribing and supporting the channel. Helping uh, more subscribers means, you know, their algorithms more likely to share these videos with other people. I'm just glad people like the videos and find get some use out of it. Just there's no real goal of mine having this channel other than just just to reach people, I guess, and share and connect. Okay, so that's basically it here. So that's the pose, exaggerated physique, exaggerated pose. I think it's pretty active might be a little bit wonky in places, like it might have gone a little bit, uh, you know, I might have broken up the rhythmical flow a little bit too much with the anatomy. But I could probably simplify that if I do another pass just to, you know, you know, all these contours that are sort of going zigzagging directions. I might maybe simplify that a little bit more, especially on the side of the form where it's going to be a little bit more stretched out, like this far side. Uh, and, you, you know, there's an extended side of each limb, too, that can be maybe be more simplified. But anyway, that's about all the time I want to spend on that one there. All right, maybe we'll do one more or two more. We'll see how it goes. Let's uh, close that down. And let's see what other... Got that figure. Let's see what other ones here I have. Yeah, let's see. Let's do this... Uh, yeah, let's do this muscle guy, and then um, then I have a special one I want to do after that, actually. A special one? Yeah, so more of a current events type thing or a popular Ooh, subject. Ooh, a surprise. Yeah. Because, you know, most likely you're not going to be asked to draw you know, figures from old fitness magazines from the 1920s, you know, 1915. <laughs> um, you're probably going to be drawing current subjects that are pop culture figures, so... But those photos are in the public domain now, right? Because it's over 100 years old? I believe or, so. Um, or is it you know, 70? I, you know, I not forget. all the photos I have here are maybe going to be public domain. <laughs> but, uh, um, but you know, I think it's fair use because I'm uh, commenting on it, making, you know, making a statement about them. All right. Don't know who this is. Uh, Larry Scott, I guess. I don't know. I just found it online. thought it was a pretty cool pose. Let's get that exaggerated physique. Let's try to go kind of crazy on this one. So apparently Larry, Larry Scott was pretty famous. Oh yeah? He, he was nicknamed the legend and the golden boy. <laughs> okay. He was an American professional bodybuilder and won the inaugural 1965 Mr. Olympia competition. Nice. I think I'm actually going to just again to have more fun and caricature the body. I'm gonna give him even smaller legs, and he doesn't have small legs. It's not. I'm not trying to dig at him or anything like that. I just think it's kind of funny and caricature to for a muscle guy to have sort of really big upper body and smaller lower body because it just heightens that sense of that massive bulk. So in this one, my, uh, the gesture, you know, I haven't really done a single through line. I'm more just kind of, this is more about constructing the caricature exaggeration. So I might actually do the through line or that main line of action right after I get this sort of figured out. So this is sort of a concept sketch in this phase right now. 
like how much exaggeration do I want to do? And I did do this guy for practice for my thumbnail drawing for the, you know, the YouTube thumbnail that I used. Um, so I didn't want to repeat that same type of exaggeration. So that's why I wanted to go a little bit further on what I'm drawing in this time. Okay, and so yeah, that's the rough thumbnail concept. I kind of like that. Um, now let's get the action here, the, the sort of the movement of the spine. It's sort of a S curve, I think. It's going back and then tilting his pelvis forward a little bit more, in which case that would make this leg want to come over here a little bit more. It's a good thing I did that because that helps direct, you know, where the limbs, you know, sit and where they come out of is that, is that main line of action. Without, without the main line of action being consistent and being th well thought out, it, your figure can look really disjointed or not well balanced. Okay. I know it's a little sloppy. Hopefully you can sort of keep on following what I'm doing, though. forearm needs to be a bit longer because his, his right forearm the, or the forearm that's on our left is quite a bit longer so this one's going to hang down pretty low there we go and that helps with the overall physique too just the caricaturing of it makes him look even more bulky cool it's um since it's pretty sloppy i'm going to dim this layer down and draw on top of it so i don't have to worry about erasing so much Okay, let's do like a real simple form here. Not super detailed with the anatomy, but just enough to, you know, pass for, you know, a human physique. You up for taking more questions? Sure. And I guess we're going another 20 minutes today? Yeah, I guess that's the plan. We'll just try to finish the normal time. Didn't realize it was already over an hour. Went by quick. Uh, Alan's wanting to know, when getting stuck in pinpointing what features to caricature of a particular person, do you ever research others' approach, or do you feel that it is cheating or finding yourself taking the easy way out? No, uh, I think it's definitely valid technique to see what other people have done. But just be careful it doesn't influence you too much because you don't honestly you don't want to repeat you know the choices of another artist you know because they you know it's a result of their style and their life decisions and their skill set and so if even if you try to kind of copy what another master has done on a character of a particular subject you might not be able to pull that off at all because as soon as you try to copy the main concept without understanding that that artist's training and journey um, you're likely to just flub it up even more than if you just tried. It's, it's sort of like trying to complete another, you know, uh, write a letter in someone else's handwriting or forge a thing without being able looking at it the entire time. Because if you, if you steal too much and don't have what it takes to back it up and continue in that same vein, it just won't look right. So, uh, but yeah, but I think it's, it's valid to just to see what people did, like, you know, if you see everyone gives that particular subject a large jaw and chin and you haven't thought of that, that can definitely be educational. Like, be, oh, okay, that's a, that's a good way to go is a large jaw and large chin. I didn't think about that. So something like that could definitely be helpful. So yeah, definitely do it if you feel you want to. Just don't try to copy any one person, of course. I have seen people take other people's caricatures and just almost copy them line for line. Yeah, it's never good. I mean, it's. I think it's okay if you do that for personal study. Oh yeah, definitely. To learn, for personal, but, yeah. But you probably should not post it because even if you post it and say, "Hey, this is just a study. This is reference," things can get misconstrued so quickly on the internet. I mean, somebody could take a copy of that screenshot and say, "Hey, look what I found." <laughs> 
Yeah, and then that original artist, all of a sudden, if they find it, they don't see a reference to the fact that you admitted that you know it's a study, a copy of their work. The person who reposts that might not give that same credit to that artist, and I think you're stealing from them. Yeah. You know, or trying to plagiarize. I mean, even if your intention wasn't that, that's just my opinion, though. Yeah. Unless you, I mean, you could write right on the image, study after so-and-so, like literally, like so it can't be taken out of the image, right. you know. <laughs> Though it's so easy nowadays with Photoshop to I guess. take anything out, even watermarks. Definitely feel free to do actual copies of people's work you like. That's yes. definitely a good training technique. But, yeah, and, but if you do post it, it's like, why are you posting that? To show us that you can copy good? I mean, the copying should be just really for your benefit. There's no real reason to share it on social media for your, you know, that's not the kind of content you necessarily need or want. Um, it's just, you know, you don't need to show everyone every single sketch in your book, for instance. It's just keep some things to yourself. So the bodybuilder you were drawing was actually the influence or the guy who influenced Arnold Schwarzenegger. Nice. So he's pretty important when it comes to the bodybuilding world. Yeah, I just, I think I got this off of Wikipedia or Wikimedia, so I didn't, but I didn't even read it. And I was just like, oh, okay. Shame on you. <laughs> well, I was in a hurry. Oh. Personally, you know what bugs me about when people, like when I see comic book superhero drawings? This is just a side note about muscular bodies. Uh, there's just such this tendency to draw every single muscle as if it's currently being flexed or active, even on the side of the body where it should be relaxed technically, um, because it's just not that's not how the human body operates. It's like not every, both calves don't contract at the same time as all of your forearm and upper arm muscles and all your back muscles at the same time, unless you're being like electrically shocked. <laughs> So it's just kind of funny. I see that and I'm like, man, it's, it's it's really commonplace to draw every muscle as if it's completely ripped and completely jacked and activated at that particular time. Well, aren't most superheroes mutants anyway? Or something happened to them? And that's usually yeah, what's, what are in comics. I mean, people are drawing Batman and he has no special powers. And But like every single muscle oh, is constantly true. being active and um, strained at the exact same time. I don't think so. Good point. Just a little bugaboo of mine. But I know that's, you know, it's not why people read comic books. It's, just, you know, they're trying to, you know, show the heroic ideal. You know, the superheroes are our modern day gods. Someone who does a really good job, who doesn't do that to the figures, is Alex Ross. You know, he draws people very naturalistically, I think. You almost really never see tensed or flexed muscles in an Alex Ross drawing. Except when it's really called for. Okay, almost done with this guy. Okay. So yeah, I could spend a lot of time on this, making this, you know, more anatomically correct and indicating all these muscle insertions and stuff. But um, yeah, that's not what this today's about. But yeah, that's my muscle caricature body here. Okay, let's move on to our last subject of the day. Um, let's get rid of him here. And let's find it. So I've been, uh, you know, watching Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And I thought uh, Sam Wilson, the Falcon, would be a good figure to draw. He's always flying and bodies at interesting dynamic angles. So he's a really good superhero to uh, to try to draw. 
So we've got these two different versions of him here. Um, I think I think the lower, the bigger one here is more dynamic, whereas the one on the one on the right is a great pose, but it's like a pure profile of you. So it's there's not as much opportunity to draw interesting, cool angles and overlapping forms. So I think I'm going to do this uh, this one here. And again, I'm going to try to caricature him. So I'm going to heighten the physique, make it more muscular, but also just try to make the pose more dynamic and active. All right. And like usual, I'm going to start with the head. Pretty small because there's, well, I mean, there's the wings to consider. What I'll maybe do, you know what, I think I'll draw his figure actually a little bit bigger. And then I'll shrink it down if I need to to draw the wings in. The wings are not quite as important to the pose right now. But I, what I want to do is be able to draw this so you guys can see it properly. So I won't draw too small. Okay, so I'm going to draw the through line, which is from his head down to his most extended foot, I think. I think he's puffing out his chest a little bit, so I'm going to heighten that a little bit more. So it's going to create a kind of an S curve down to his foot. And that's the main action of the pose right there as I see it. And then the angle of the shoulders. Give him a real broad chest and shoulders. Arms are just kind of out at the side. Basically, it's a symmetrical pose is they're equally distant from the body. But because of the perspective and foreshortening, this one's going to look like it's a little further out. Raises up a little higher here, give myself more room. So this is definitely different from a lot of the other poses in that there's no weight-bearing foot. He's not on the ground, you know, he's flying. So it's a very different feeling from a lot of the other action poses we've done. So you have to find um, the areas where you're going to have the forms more extended and more compacted in a different way, or you just sort of have to analyze it a little more. So I think the side that his leg is up is going to be a little more contracted. Well, that's not necessarily the case here. So if he's actually puffing out his chest, yeah, so he's actually going to have more of an extended torso, and the back side is going to be a little bit more compressed. If I'm heightening the action of the pose anyway, I'm exaggerating a little bit. So There we go. So yeah, these are just things I'm just sort of mentally figuring out as I'm doing them. So this uh, backside, you know, where his back is and hip will have a little bit more of curvature and bends in them than the front side. Okay, and I'll give a real quick indication of the wings here coming off his shoulders. But that's the rest of that's for later. I just wanted to get something in there for the wings. Okay. Now let's uh, break it down a little bit more accurately now just and start building some anatomy on top of this um, I'm gonna sort of pretend he doesn't have armor on and just draw sort of the physique without all that bulkiness just because that's gonna help me sort of clearly uh, identify the shapes and the forms that I'm drawing You know, the armor on superheroes too is really meant to mimic the look of musculature. So it's it's kind of there for me. All these cut lines and stripes and things like that. The division lines on the armor plating is sort of where the muscles naturally fall anyway on most superhero armor.
I know the thing about Sam Wilson is not that he's super jacked. He's not like the Hulk. But I am trying to do, you know, to show physical strength. And uh, so it does result, I think, in a sort of exaggerated musculature in the body here. So that is something to consider. You don't have to draw every superhero as if they are the Hulk. It's not a requirement or anything. Because he's, you know, he's pretty lean, pretty lean guy. But definitely muscular still. Any questions or anything? Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to hear some questions? Sure. <laughs> I'm sure I can find something. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's one from Kaysom. Hi, Court. You can make real life people look like caricatures, but can you make caricatures look like real life people? My God, I never thought of that. <laughs> Actually, I just saw a video yesterday that there is a website that takes your drawing and creates an AI photo of it so it looks like a real person. But you you have to tweak it a little bit, and I can't remember the name of the site. I'll see if I can find it. But uh, no, I've never had cause to do that, to de-caricature someone's caricature. <laughs> Um, and Comic Legend says a majority of Alex Ross's paintings are recreations of other artists' covers or art just painted in his style. Mm, well, I mean, he's done his own books, you know, his own panels and, you know, at Kingdom Come, I read that. Um, so I don't know if he's actually, he's not just redrawing or copying someone else's book on that, is he? Or maybe he was. I don't know. Maybe Kingdom Come was some other artist's work. I'm, I'm not really a big comic book guy, so I don't really know all the trivia. But you can tell he relies very heavily on photo reference. Um, I don't know how much. You know, maybe he's just so good that he can make his paintings look like they were photogra from, done from photographs. But, uh, but I've, you know, I've read his... I got a book or two of his, you know, The Art of Alex Ross. And, you know, he has costumes made by people and has models come in. Um, and I think that's great. I mean, I, it's, it's real, like real gritty realism in comic books. And I really, really like that. It's a nice change from uh, the really comic style. So I want to continue with questions here. Sure. Uh, Jim Sketch Testing asks, do you find a big difference between drawing directly on a screen like a Cintiq compared to drawing on a tablet connected to a computer? Which one's easier to draw with? Um, well, I started out digital painting, digital drawing on an Intuos tablet that, you know, you couldn't, see what you were you couldn't look at your hand while you're drawing you had to look up at a screen and i got used to it for sure it's definitely can be done there's a lot of amazing artists that do that um still to this day they don't give up their old intuos tablets they just because that's what they're used to but once i made the transition to a cintiq screen it's i don't want to go back ever <laughs> so yeah i mean there's definitely you can definitely do it and do great work with it but um yeah i really like the uh, screen drawing on the screen itself that you can see. So this isn't the site I was talking about earlier, but apparently there is a site where it takes, it takes a sketch that you've done, just a quick sketch of a face and then creates an AI photo from it. So it's an AI generated person based on your sketch. Yeah, pretty crazy. I don't know, those AI-generated people, though, they always look a little off to me. There's always something about them. Oh, well. Uh, let's see. Another question. Miro says, I think that Stan Lee said superhero costumes are just lines drawn on nude figures. Do you think there's truth to that? Oh, gosh, yeah. Especially, I mean, some artists are much worse at that than others. But yeah, there's a lot of artists who just draw as if the costume is just painted on a nude body and it, you don't see any creases or wrinkles at where the limbs join up with the torso. It's just stuff like that. And again, there's that's fine. It's a fantasy comic book world, whatever. But I, I personally like to see artists that know how to do drapery and folds and stuff. And 
don't know, it's just, I think it's more absorbing and interesting to look at, and I can appreciate it more based on the art, the more realistic it is. And that's just me, that's my personal opinion. I think I'm uh, looking at Sam's costume, though, from, uh, you know, the Falcon. Uh, it looks great, it looks cool, but it just, one thing that does not seem practical are his exposed forearms, because this guy's always flying up in the air, and it's cold up there. Once you get up, you know, past a few thousand feet, it's definitely a lot colder. Um, someone like, I mean, he doesn't wear, like, his, uh, he doesn't have a respirator or anything, so I doubt he goes above, like, 10,000 feet, so I guess it's plausible that uh, he could have exposed forearms, but it just doesn't seem very practical for a uh, flying costume. Uh, also, no helmet. I mean, come on, you're flying at high speeds, crashing through windows and walls and things. No helmet. <laughs> and he's not a super soldier or anything. He's just a regular guy. So, I don't know. Just from a practical standpoint, just another thing I just thought of. It's like, why are they exposed forearms? It just looks cool. I think that's the main answer. Looks like we got a couple minutes left. If anyone has any last minute questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Okay. Yeah, just wrapping this up here. Let me just add some wings to him. Well, you know, let me do more on his face. It kind of, uh, I really like his face and his likeness. I don't know if I have time to do anything on it, but uh, it's a really cool look. I like his head shape. And I did check. It looks like your Biden Harris print is for sale in your store. Oh, good. Okay. Thought I put it up there. You know, just barely enough of a face here to get a subtle indication of where his you know head is turned. Shrink him down a little bit. Then his wings. All right. So yeah, that is basically yeah all I can show you on dynamic action bodies. Uh, get that center line. Start with the head. Get the main line of action of the pose. Just figure out if it's a C curve, an S curve, or an L or a Z or whatever it is, and then just build the forms very simply around it. Go step by step. Go baby steps, and uh, I think you'll get there. It's just a matter of uh, being observant and making strong choices about what you want to do with with the forums. All right, let's um, wrap things up here. Any other questions or comments that I uh, didn't get to? Uh, Alan was thanking you for worrying about the superhero's safety. Oh, yeah. I mean, gosh, he's poor Sam. He doesn't have a helmet. And he's not a super soldier. He's just a regular <laughs> dude. I mean, I fell off my bike once, and I was so glad I had a helmet because I would have conked my head on the pavement, and that would have been it. So, I mean... Helmets yeah. are important. Don't forget they your helmets. Are. Helmets are important. Uh, and Mira was asking if there are any plans on drawing more Zelda. Oh, yeah. If you like it. I mean, I love Zelda, so I'm always happy to do more Zelda subjects uh, for sure. So I'll write that down as a possible area of interest. And I got to finish my Zelda painting that I did of her, the realistic one, uh, last year. Wait, you never finished that? I, well, I got to a point where I 
thought it was finished and then I looked at it the next day and I just didn't like it. I'm like, you know, I need to do some more on this. So it's 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 one of those where I wasn't satisfied with what I did. But that happens a lot. Uh, but that's about it for now, I guess. Uh, thank you, Debbie, for helping with the stream, as You're always, welcome. and helping answer questions. And thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Get to drawing some figures and some bodies, and when the world opens back up and we can get in front of real-life models, be sure you do that, because that, that will help wait. more than anything, I think, uh, learning how to draw the human figure. Um, and that's it. Anyway, thank you again, and I will see you hopefully soon in the next two weeks. Bye, everybody. Bye.